anybody that is good at presenting cannot start with statistics because statistics put an audience to sleep. And I'm going to risk it. I'm going to try and tell a narrative because I, I can't tell the rest of the story without setting the, uh, uh, the screen for you. Back in 2004, we started to, uh, through uh, a service called the Print Measurement uh, Bureau, we started to track participation in golf across the, uh, the province. And the Print uh, Measurement Bureau, uh, PMB data, was primarily used um, to measure the media reach um, of newspapers and, uh, and television and a lot of different things. But what, when they went out and surveyed, they asked people what sport did they play, and they asked people how often do you play it. And it was the most cost-effective way that we could find to start to measure uh, participation rates in, uh, uh, in golf. So that's what we started in 2004. We continued in 2015. Uh, the print uh, PMB merged with NADBank, which was their competitor, uh, and created a much deeper uh, data set. Um, so for the last several years, we have been enabled to, uh, um, to, to take a much deeper look at participation because we have a, we have a much deeper data set in which to, uh, to look at. But I show you this uh, uh, chart. You can see that over the past 15 years, we've averaged about a 15% participation rate for golf within the, uh, within the province. And that makes us still the number one participation sport in the, uh, in the country. And 15%, although it doesn't look like we're growing, the population in British Columbia grows every year. So if we can maintain at 15% in absolute numbers, uh, golf continues to, uh, to grow. So we have averaged at that. Now you can see that uh, when we first started in 2004, we were at 16%. We went down to 15.9%, and then you'll see a big drop. And I'm sure all of us remember what happened in 2008. Um, we lost a couple of banks. Um, we went into an economic uh, meltdown. If you compare this graph to a, uh, uh, a graph of what was happening in the economy, you will see the same sharp V. We bounced back from that relatively uh, quickly, got back up to, uh, uh, to just a little over 15% by 2009. And then in 2011, um, the economy again took uh, a downturn, and we went into more of what's called a U-shaped um, uh, inversion, and we got down to a low of, uh, uh, of just about 10%. Since that time, uh, we climbed back up uh, to 2016, where we got back to historical uh, levels, and then you'll see 2017. And what happened in 2017, as far as golf is concerned, is that we had an incredibly poor start to the year. Most of you can remember, I don't think we really started to play golf in this province until July. Uh, there was a lot of people that uh, um, you know, just wouldn't play in the, in the weather conditions that we had. And then we had a lot of smoke and forest fires around the province, um, which it impacted our financial uh, situation, but it kept a lot of people uh, off the, uh, the golf course. Now, we don't know for sure that that's exactly what happened, but we can make it a pretty educated guess because we also track participation rates for two groups, women and seniors. And I can tell you that in both groups in 2017, we saw a decrease in the number of women that were playing and the number of senior men that were playing. And if you had to make a guess as to who would not be playing in bad air conditions, those are the two groups that I would have picked right off the, uh, the top. So we're, we're pretty satisfied that we know what happened. But look at what happened in 2018. And if we look back last year, we had an incredibly great summer for golf. We started early. 
the weather was, uh, was great. We didn't have as much rain. It kind of is a little bit eerily similar to what's happening this March. You know, this is the second driest March in, uh, um, in history. If you go and look at what's happening at this golf course, I can tell you that it's absolutely full and it's been full for the entire month. So it looks like 2019 is heading um, or starting out to be a, uh, a very good uh, year. So this is the size, overall size of the uh, golf mar market and you can see the, uh, the blue graph is uh, participation by men. The uh, red graph is uh, participation by, uh, by women. And I presented it two different ways. Uh, again, you can see the, uh, the numbers below. So in 2015, um, we had 656,000 uh, British Columbia's, Columbians played at least one round of golf. In 2016, we got to 679,000. 2017 is when we saw the, uh, the drop. We went down to 529,000. Uh, and last year, we were up to 858,000. Right. So if you listen to the mainstream media, particularly a lot of the, the business media, who tell you that golf is a dying sport, I can tell you that the facts do not support that. The facts are that we are a, uh, we continue to be a growing sport. This is measured by frequency of participation. So we measure three levels. Infrequent is someone that only spend, or that only plays once or twice a year. A casual golfer is somebody that plays between two and ten times a year. And a core golfer is someone that uh, plays over 10 rounds a year. And the key numbers that you need to take a look at are the relationship between the infrequent, the casual, and the core um, from year to year. Because that will tell us whether or not we are bringing people into the game and whether we are moving them further into the game. So if we, can, if we can change somebody from an infrequent golfer to a casual golfer, then we need to figure out how we can move them to being a core golfer. Because statistically, we know that if we can get somebody to play eight rounds of golf, um, we have a 70% chance of turning them into a core golfer. So this is all data that's been freely available for um, a long time. And that's really what we, we want to focus on. Now what I'm going to show you now is the same graph, uh, participation rates of female golfers by frequency of participation. So you can see in 2018, uh, the purple line at the, uh, at the top um, shows you the uh, uh, participation between the infrequent, casual, and core for each of the, uh, the past four years. And for your benefit, I flipped it around on this graph. And interestingly enough, you can see in 2018, the core golfers, which are defined by the green line, intersected and went through the casual golfers. What that means is that when we had a good year last year, we had some casual golfers that got into the game. Weather was great, they were having a good time, and they played more golf. So they changed category from a casual player to a core player. What we now need to work on is we need to make, work on making sure that as we bring people into the game and as we bring women into the game, we take the red line and we have the red line intersect through the blue line which means that we are bringing people into the game, we are making sure that they have an enjoyable experience, and that is in fact what we need to do in order to grow the game. Now this is, this, I found this statistic to be extremely interesting 
This is the, uh, the breakdown of, uh, of golfers um, by household uh, condition. So couples with children living at home, 49%, uh, almost 50% of, uh, uh, of golfers live in this type of a household. But look at the number for women, 36%. So we hear an awful lot that women can't play golf because they have children at home. The facts are not supporting that. Now what may be happening is that um, maybe the children are getting a little bit older, maybe uh, some of the women that are at home have uh, a little bit uh, more free time so they're getting out and, uh, and playing. Um, but they absolutely are playing. And if we could ever move to the stage where we became, and Debbie Pine is in the room, Debbie is the one that, that told me this. She said, you need to start talking about double F. Double F is family friendly and female friendly. And as a sport, those are the two double Fs that we need to, uh, need to be focused on. But if our golf courses be, could, could become family friendly and we could get the kids playing with their parents. That's another way that we can grow uh, golf for women. But what's also interesting about that is look at what happens when the children leave home. Couples with no children living at home, women outnumber men in playing golf. And when you get to an empty nester, they significantly outnumber men. So I think the facts are telling us that we have a lot of interest from women in playing golf and we need to look at everything that we can do as a sport uh, to make sure that when they try the game that they are having a good time. And that's really what every session today that we will talk about comes back to. We need to make this game fun. If we, want to, uh, if we want to grow it, and we need to start using data to make our decisions. Because when I started in this business, it was, well, you know, last year was a pretty good year, and our membership was up, so therefore golf was up, and we had no basis for making that. It just, it was kind of, we sat around in a room somewhere and decided that, you know, golf was in a, in a good space. Uh, now we're using uh, data to, uh, to do it. We also, I said we track uh, participation rates uh, by various different ethnic uh, communities. Look at the increase in 2018 in the Aboriginal community. Um, you know, it's absolutely remarkable. And, and what's interesting about this is that the Aboriginal, Aboriginal First Nation communities in the province, their demographics are exactly opposite to the rest of the province. 50% of all Aboriginal uh, people within British Columbia um, are youth. So if we can get them playing more, then we will keep them as lifelong golfers. And we have, I think Patrick, you told me something like 17 um, bands within the province that have a significant investment in golf. That's, you know, it's a significant amount of the golf population is, uh, is owned um, by First Nations. Um, I think a, a goal for, uh, for us would be to see them not only have ownership, but to bring players into the game and at some point uh, have enough people that they not only own, but they operate and manage uh, those facilities. Um, I think that would be a tremendous outcome if we could get there. In absolute numbers, because everything that I've talked to you about before is percentages, participation percentage, but this graph, the purple line in each category, shows you the absolute numbers of golfers. So while we, uh, we may be down in, in, as a participation rate for Chinese golfers, that's, we're, we're down because there are more Chinese living in British Columbia um, than, than are currently playing golf. But in absolute numbers, um, we're growing in, in that community uh, as well. 
So finally, uh, if you look at the, uh, at the bottom, if you add the numbers up for 2018 of all of the various um, different groups, it totals about 250,000 250, uh, golfers, which is roughly 25 percent of the, uh, the golfing population in, uh, in British Columbia is represented by uh, something other than Caucasian golfers. So the, uh, you know, the statement that, that golf is a, a game only played by white Caucasian males who all belong to Shaughnessy and Capilano, because I've heard that for years, um, is just not simply true in the province. So let me get into the Women in Golf Charter. And this was a charter and a, uh, uh, a challenge statement put out by the Royal and Ancient uh, last year, it was, uh, the charter was signed in a ceremony in London in, uh, I believe, May of, uh, of 2018. Um, and it, talked, it, it looked at the opportunity to increase participation by golf if we just focused on getting more women playing the, uh, uh, the game. So the RNA issued a challenge. Um, I'm pleased to say that Golf Canada uh, was one of the uh, first signatories um, to, the, uh, uh, to the charter. Uh, Golf Australia uh, was a signatory to the, uh, to the charter. And one by one, the golf federations around the world uh, made a commitment in writing um, as to what they would do to, uh, to grow uh, women in golf. So I'm not going to read that to you. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory as to what the, uh, what the commitment on the part of the RNA is. Women in Golf Charter specifically aims to strengthen the focus on gender balance and provide a, a united position for the golf industry. Commit national federations and organizations to support measures targeted at increasing participation of women, girls, and families in golf. Call upon signatories to take positive action to support the recruitment, retention, and progression of women working at all levels of the sport. You know, quite frankly, we need to get more women into senior management uh, positions within the golf industry. And yesterday we had a very exciting announcement with uh, Ashley Zibrick being named the interim um, uh, head golf professional and director of golf for Shaughnessy Golf Club. I think that's a, that's a big statement as not only to the ability of Ashley because she's a, uh, a wonderful golf uh, professional, but it shows a, a movement by the industry to get more uh, women involved. Set individual targets for national associations for participation, membership, and more importantly, report, reporting. We need to come back and we need to report annually. So I can tell you with British Columbia Golf, we're going to tell you what we're going to do and you will have the ability to give us a passing or failing grade at the end of the year um, because the, the evidence will be there as to whether or not we made the, uh, the commitments and develop an inclusive environment for women and girls within golf. And I can tell you that that's an easy statement to make. It's not an easy thing to do. You know, I, uh, in certain ways, I failed as a father because I didn't get my daughter involved in golf. I am doing a much better job with my grandchildren. Uh, and I... I can say with a whole lot of pride that I'm doing a very good job with my granddaughter who's 12 and she likes to go out, she likes to play with me. But there are no other girls at the club for her to play with. So, you know, we, I, I take her to her lessons. The boys are happy to go out to the driving range with her and, uh, and hit balls. But when they go play, they don't ask her. So, you know, I go play with her. We need to change that. Because we can't get girls involved if we don't get more girls involved because that's how uh, they want to, uh, to move forward. So this is our statement. British Columbia Golf fully supports inclusiveness and is proud to support the Women in Golf Charter as led by the RNA. 
Our targets as a charter signatory in 2019 are the following. First of all, we will support Golf Canada in reaching their targets as a signatory. And if you go on our website, we will have a link so that you can see what Golf Canada has committed to. We will do whatever we need to do in order to support Golf Canada in, meet, in meeting their objectives in this corner of the world. Provide opportunity and support women golfers in British Columbia to affiliate and support the LPGA Amateur Golf Association and LPGA Women's Network. And I am delighted to announce today that we have entered into a partnership with the LPGA Amateur Golf Association. Women in British Columbia um, will be enabled to join the LPGA Amateur Golf Association directly. Um, we will be managing um, that relationship. We will be working with our member clubs to provide opportunities um, for women to play in, uh, uh, in events. Um, the women that join the LPGA Amateur Golf Association will be affiliated with similar groups throughout North America. When they travel, there will be opportunities for them to play in different, uh, uh, in different events. I've already um, been contacted by the Seattle chapter who wants to do a girls trip to British Columbia to play against some of the, uh, the women here. So over the next few years, as we build membership in that organization, we will start um, creating more opportunities for um, those players to get together. This is, when you join the amateur golf, LPG Amateur Golf Association, you're not gonna get a handicap. You want to play in a, in a competition, you want a handicap, you're still going to have to join British Columbia Golf. Uh, but there will be opportunities to play in all kinds of fun events um, with the Amateur Golf Association, uh, with the LPGA. And more importantly, it will be an opportunity for women to support other women as we build the, uh, the game. So I hope everybody considers uh, joining it. I think that it's, uh, it's going to be a wonderful organization and it's a wonderful opportunity for women in British Columbia to affiliate with the LPGA. We will actively market and the hashtag invite her on all British Columbia digital and social media platforms and in a minute I'll explain what, uh, what that program is. We will commit to providing equal and balanced media coverage of women and girls in competitive and recreational golf. Now this is pretty easy because I think we've been doing this for the last couple of years. Um, but you know, when we look at our tournament schedule, we, we try to ensure that we are giving equal coverage wherever we can, whether it's a, uh, uh, a men's event, men's amateur, a women's amateur. We focus on our top, uh, uh, female uh, players. We are incredibly proud of the talent that is coming out of British Columbia when we look at the girls that represent us in our, uh, um, in our national team championships. Um, Debbie Pine is the managing director of uh, uh, sport development. We make huge investments in, uh, uh, in our junior girls uh, programs, but I can also tell you that we make investments in our amateur women's programs, we make in investments in our senior women's programs. We want all women um, to represent British Columbia well, and we take a lot of pride in, uh, uh, in the success that they have on the, uh, the golf course. Um, unfortunately, uh, Oregon's not in the room. They keep beating us in the PNGA Cup matches because um, they have, their women are a little bit stronger than ours at the moment, but uh, we're going to catch up. We want to embrace International Women's Golf Day on June the 4th, 2019, which also happens to be a fairly significant uh, Women's Congress. We'll be in, uh, in Vancouver, what is it, uh, June 3rd to 6th? Michelle Collins, uh, who will be introduced later, will, will shortly be officially our, our new president. Michelle is the manager of sport tourism for the, uh, uh, the city of Vancouver. 
Uh, Michelle is heavily involved in the, uh, in the women's com uh, conference. Uh, Shauna Wilton is with Vancouver Parks and Recreation. Joan Probert is here. All of them are critically involved in that conference, and we hope to roll some type of a, uh, a golf event uh, into it. We will solicit and support and encourage all of our member clubs to support I International Women's Golf Day on June the 4th. And just to give you an, an idea as to what some of the clubs have done, uh, Victoria Golf Club closes their golf course to men for that day. Richmond Country Club, the club that I belong to, closes their course to men for that day. The women are encouraged to bring their friends out. They're encouraged to just have fun. We don't run competitions. They're encouraged to do some different activities, whether it's a, a golf fashion show or something else. Um, I can tell you that at last year's event at, uh, at Vancouver, and I'm going to have Joan come up and talk about what the city is doing again this year. If you go on to the Mod Golf podcast, um, you can listen to the interviews that Colin did uh, last year with uh, uh, the women that participated in Vancouver. And also the story of uh, Lisa Godet, who is the, uh, the founder and, and chief organizer of the International um, Women's Golf Day, which has expanded uh, around the world. And finally, we will celebrate and support the Astor Cup. And the Astor Cup, many of you may have vague recollections of the old Commonwealth Cup matches. They have been going since, I believe, 1959. Um, that competition happens every four years. Um, this year's competition is being held in British Columbia. It's being held at Royal Colwood. It's a four-person team competition between uh, Canada, uh, Great Britain, Ireland, uh, South Africa, New Zealand, and Australia. Um, and we will, British Columbia Golf will have a big presence um, at that event. And we are hoping to build an activity around that event um, that will celebrate the, uh, uh, the women that we're bringing from all over the world uh, to play golf, but also the coaches, um, and we'll be doing something relative to, uh, to golf and, uh, and health. So we are really looking forward to the event in, uh, in Victoria. Um, I think it's, uh, it's going to be um, the cap to what we hope to be a very successful uh, year in, uh, in building women's golf in, uh, in British Columbia. And it's the start of what we need to do um, every year going forward uh, if we want to continue to, uh, to grow the game. So now I'm going to introduce you to the uh, Invite Her campaign. so much bigger. It began as just a fun hobby for me and a way to make new connections. And then it grew into an outlet to challenge myself and help my career. It just goes to show you never know where an invitation can take you. Now it's my turn to invite you. And when we say invite to play golf. We really mean it. It's not, you know, a phone call or an email, you know, why don't we play golf sometime later this summer? It's why don't we play golf next Wednesday? Or if you don't play golf, why don't you come to the golf club with me next Wednesday? We'll have lunch. We'll go out to the driving range. We'll talk to the golf professional. We'll have some fun. We'll introduce you. So you actually have to follow up on the invitation. Because as an industry, we have always said we do those things. This time, we need to make sure that we actually do. The final video that I'm going to show you, I'm, I apologize. Uh, again, it's a, it's a little bit long. Um, this was launched last week. 
Um, the LPGA is uh, in the process of, uh, of rebranding, and uh, it has what I consider to be an excellent opportunity for Canada. Recently, there's been a lot of discussion about diversity and inclusion, women's empowerment, authenticity, individual leadership. At the LPGA, we are excited to see governments and businesses and associations all around the world embrace these important social issues. But at the LPGA, these things have been part of our DNA for 70 years. You see, at the LPGA, we're a living, breathing example of these important topics. Our athletes don't have multi-million dollar contracts with option years and no trade clauses. They're independent, successful businesswomen. They run their own businesses, hire and fire their own teams. These athletes are moms. These athletes are kids. They come from all over the world in every shape and every size. Now, I get it. They probably don't look like, walk like, talk like your stereotype of what a leader should be. And you know what? That's okay with them. They know the difference they're making is on the next generation, the young ones that watch them and are inspired by them. Understand this simple fact. More companies have joined the LPJ in the last few years than at any time in our history. More businesses are joining us now than ever before. Why is that? I'm sure they love the talent and skill these professional athletes bring to the golf course. But what's really clear is they, they love and, and respect what these athletes represent and how they impact so much more than golf. When you see the LPGA, you might just see great golfers. But don't be surprised if your young daughters and sons see so much more. Empowerment, individuality, role models. We felt it was time to position our unique group of athletes, teachers, and leaders exactly as they are, standing on the shoulders of the women who came before them and fully prepared to put the future on their shoulders. I hope you enjoy the LPGA repositioning that we call Drive On, because for 70 years, women have been driving on to create greater opportunities for the women that will follow them. To our incredible sponsors who saw these qualities in us, maybe before we did, to our global fans that have helped spread the word and change the face of leadership worldwide. And to our amazing athletes and teachers who inspire us. And more importantly, they inspire the generation that will follow us. To all of you, we have two simple words. Drive on. This is for every girl who's ever been left at or told she doesn't belong. This is for every girl who's been told she's too loud, too quiet, too this, or too that. This is for every girl who thinks her body isn't good enough. This is for every girl who feels she doesn't fit in. This is for every girl who's been told that success and kindness are two different things. This is for every girl who's been told to give up. This is us crushing it for you. So you can crush it for the next girl. So that's the commitment that British Columbia Golf is making towards the uh, Charter for Women. Um, we invite everybody in the room to come back next year and uh, critique how well we, uh, we did. Uh, but we're looking forward to an exciting year. I'd now like to uh, ask Joan Probert from the uh, Vancouver Parks and Recreation to come up and talk about what they're doing this summer. Thanks, Chris. I'm really excited to be here and really honored to be asked to speak today on behalf of the Vancouver Board of Parks and Recreation. We do have a lot of really exciting initiatives this year, and uh, I'm just thrilled to be able to share those with you. You know, I'm really grateful to work with a really dedicated team of individuals and an organization that is really driven and exists to support our communities. A few of our organizational objectives this year include um, inclusivity and accessibility, health and wellness, and also promoting sport for life. All of which align perfectly with our role in providing public access to golf in the Lower Mainland. As part of our commitment to inclusivity and access, we are obviously focusing on women in, in golf. 
And we have a couple of objectives this year uh, that we'll be focusing on this year and in years to come that we really think are going to make a difference. The first one that I'd like to share with you is just about how women feel when they arrive at our courses. We're going to spend some time this year really focusing on what our course environment looks like when they arrive and the comfort level they feel when they get there. And this isn't just the physical attributes of the course, but also the cultural attributes of the course. We've spoken to many women, and I've had the privilege of being involved in some women's forums where a lot of dialogue has come up in regards to how women feel when they're participating, playing golf, or even at a course with the dialogue that they have with other players. Um, often women feel patronized or they feel less than when they're playing with different members of the community. And we really hope to make a difference in educating our public on how to maybe change that dialogue and change that culture. That starts with our team and the way they approach our customers um, and the way they dialogue with our customers. And it also involves our customers themselves. Um, and we hope to we hope to be able to educate them through dialogue in our newsletters. We have a 25,000 person database of a very actively engaged newsletter readers that we hope to be able to communicate some subtle conversation in regards to how dialogue should happen on the golf course. And it's not about men and women, it's about golfers. And we really want to start promoting that dialogue. Another thing that we're hoping to achieve in, the, in supporting the uh, hashtag invite her is to work with our women's leagues to get them to start bringing out young women to the course as part of their league play. Um, I've got one of our women's league members in the audience here today and who we spoke with last week and, and, and working with them to really pick days and times where we can get them to be the advocates for bringing young women out to the course and we will, uh, we will be able to support them in doing that. And once we make that step, we hope to grow it even further and, and use our women's leagues as a real advocate for helping us promote that. Three, we're hoping to, uh, we, are ho we are hosting the Vancouver Open again this year. We uh, it came back to the Vancouver courses last year and we will be hosting it now for the next three years as part of the Vancouver Golf Tour. Um, in our partnership with them, uh, we've had some dialogue in regards to how we can change the way the programming works to highlight women more. Hi women are now part of the program for the first year last year, and uh, it was, a, it was a, f a growing year, being the first year, to, to get the exposure to women being involved. Um, we've had some dialogue with them in regards to how we can take that to the next level moving forward. Um, one of the components that we've talked to them about is having men and women tee off consecutively together throughout the event instead of separating the, the flights. Uh, this will allow women to have the same profile as men while they're playing, especially during the final. Uh, we are working on, on promoting gallery coverage and getting some spectators out. So the ability to have the women uh, teeing off consecutively with the men is going to allow them to get that exposure that we're hoping. And this also translates right through to the awards presentations. Uh, there's quite a large fanfare in regards to the men's presentation, the trophy, the sponsors, the photographs, and there seemed to be uh, a little less of that for the ladies last year. So uh, as the park board, we're hoping to help move that forward and, and promote that so that the women are getting the same fair recognition and media coverage and celebration that the men received during that event. Also. Uh, one of the components that we're talking to our partners about adding this year uh, as part of the overall event is um, a nine-hole tournament specifically for women that we hope to tag as my first tournament as part of the, 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 the Vancouver Open. Um, this is where we hope to bring women out that would not otherwise come to a golf course because they feel intimidated about participating in a tournament. They may not have done it before. They shy away from invites uh, from their office or from any corporate um, tournament that they could be involved in because they really just don't know how to play. Uh, and they're intimidated about the process of going through that. So we hope to create this My First Tournament opportunity, invite women out, and actually show them what it, what it takes to play in a tournament and have them play in a tournament in a very non-intimidating, fun way to give them the confidence to say yes to their next invite. That's really important to us. I've, I've talked to a lot of my colleagues, and myself included, who, who have that hurdle and that intimidation factor, and we miss out on a lot because of that. And we want to 
break down those barriers for women. So that's one of the other attributes of the Vancouver Open we hope to include for this year. And last but not least, our involvement in Women's International Golf Day uh, on June 4th. Uh, this will be our fifth year participating. Um, we have uh, grown the participation uh, from the beginning uh, to uh, the last two years having sold out events. And we've really listened to the, to the feedback that we've received from our participants and we feel that we've really honed um, what we offer into a really great package. But this year we want to take it that next level further and that next step above. Um, we are looking at uh, adding some opportunities for dialogue. One of the areas we discussed where, where we might not have been hitting the mark with Women's Golf Day is the real beginner, the person who doesn't even know what to do when they arrive at a golf course. So one of the components we're hoping to include this year is, is just really an introductory session on how what, what it is. Come to a golf course, look at it, we'll talk to you about it, we'll show you what it is here, we'll, we'll show you clubs, we'll show you how people play, we'll talk to you about rules, and, and really just give women the comfort of, you know, this isn't so bad, I, I, could, I could come out and do this, and, and do that with women who are supportive and um, have gone through that process and can tell their stories of how intimidated they were to first come to the golf course. We also hope to include a panel session uh, where we can focus on uh, women in business, uh, leaders in the golf, uh, women leadership in the golf industry, um, as well as just women who have gone through the process of this overcoming their fears and, and their intimidation. And that panel discussion will allow us to open up some dialogue with the women and have a really strong exchange and we can then learn directly from them, their experiences and what hurdles they've had to overcome or the, the fears that they currently have, which will help us determine how we move forward with breaking that down. So we're really excited about all of those opportunities this year. Um, you know, we are, I would say, the best well-played public golf courses in Vancouver with over 150,000 rounds annually. And we know that we have an, a significant influence um, in, the, in regards to making positive change in our industry. And you know, we also feel that it is our responsibility as well as our privilege to advance the goals of making golf more inclusive and accessible for women and all members of our community. We are committed to supporting British Columbia Golf and the Women in Golf Charter towards achieving these goals with real action and not just lip service, as Chris would say. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joan, and we will be uh, going out to all of our member clubs, um, telling them what our commitments are um, and asking them to make similar commitments in writing um, if they are uh, interested in, in supporting this initiative as we, uh, we move forward. Um, as I said at the beginning, we are live streaming this. It's sometimes difficult to figure out how long it's going to take us to get through every section. Um, we currently are running 25 minutes ahead of time, um, so I am not starting the next session until uh, uh, 1130. Um, so I would like to invite uh, any questions, comments. I know, Lily, you said you had something that you thought might help grow. Do, do you want to uh, give us your idea? It's, this is just something that's just been floating in my head for a little while. It's um, to encourage the uh, different clubs in Vancouver and Zone 4 and to approach their clubs to see if they could sponsor some underprivileged children um, ages 4 to 18, any school age um, girl that wants to come out and try out golf. They can be partnered with a senior member, a senior women's member, and they can go out and play nine holes. And um, I was just wondering if this was something that British Columbia Golf would be interested in supporting. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. Michelle, do you want to talk about what you do with tacos? Started a program called Golf and Tacos. 
details from my understanding. I've tried to understand the concept just because it's young women coming out in Calgary and playing and they're sold out and there's over 300 young female business executives that are doing it on the courses there in a market that doesn't have the best business kind of uh, environment right now but yet the women are coming out and learning to play and being out there and I just it's a really interesting concept and I know the girl that started it lives in Vancouver now so it's pretty awesome to see like what the potential of that might be um, from my background um, and what I've been doing and so I live on the North Shore I live on the Seymour Golf Course but play at Northlands and in our complex, uh, the dads have dads night. It's called the Maples Invitational, and they go over to Northlands, and they play every night. And I was like, well, whoa, 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 where's mom's night? And for me, it was more about the concept of, yeah, every Thursday I'm told I have to be home because my husband has to go out and play golf that night, and I'm busy. I'm out and about, and I'm not home a lot. My, my husband is the primary caregiver. And so I committed to him so that he can go play. Um, but on Monday nights, I'm like, well, can I go play? And for us, it's, it's not every Monday night, it's every other Monday night. And the moms from the complex come out, and I had about five that joined me the first night. And we don't, we don't play with the, with the rules. Um, we just go out and have fun for nine holes. The course knows that we're coming in, and so they make sure that there's no one pushing us from behind for the pace of play. The course uh, offers in our package uh, the, the cart, because it is a mountain. The women will not come back out if they do not have a cart. <laughs> so let's make let's break down that barrier. And the guys in the shop come out and they pull out the bins of all the balls they find on the course. And they say, hey, why don't you guys use these? Because if you lose one, you're not going to wander into the forest to be able to go find that $8 ball that you probably bought or feel that you have to get back. And we'll just throw down a new ball and play because it's like playing hide and seek all over again. They can go find the balls when they're cleaning the course later. Um, there's a reason why someone left them for a new female coming out. They're excited to like just hit the ball and keep playing. And so that turned into five women who then told two people. We had now three groups later that came in for 12 people and we had up to 18 women coming out every other Monday night because they started telling their friends, hey, do you play golf? And the question wasn't, because the immediate answer is always, oh, I'm not good. I'm like, I'm sorry, I didn't ask you, are you good at golf? I asked you, do you play? And can you come out and join our group? And we've just seen this grow where everyone's now like, I want to come to that next year. And you know, we posted on social and I actually had some women you know, who are not in the complex but know me through our local pack. I have a five-year-old daughter. Um, and they were just like, I was really hoping you would call me and invite me. And I was like, well, why don't you just call me? Like, I'm not making the rules. Um, it really is, you know, a woman is just being asked or waiting to be invited as opposed to just saying, hey, can I come? And so we're really trying to open that up. It's been a best practice and we're really appreciative to, to Northlands opening up the course that way for us on every other Monday night. Um, and the moms love it because they feel that they can commit to that as opposed to the, the thought of having to do every single Monday because they have their kids. But at least now they're talking to their, to their partners or they might not have children. They're just joining us to come out. And we're just seeing a culture that's growing. So uh, that's our own little version. And uh, we're excited for it. And hopefully that can keep the momentum going and looking at other courses doing it too. But thanks, Chris. Thanks, Michelle. And, and you can see why we value Michelle on our board because uh, uh, with no prompting, she's able to, uh, to get up and, uh, uh, and be right on point in talking about what we want to, uh, uh, what we want to talk about. Um, I, I think we, we, we did it earlier um, and, and it was done in the, in the video. I think, you know, we, the LPGA um, just finished an event down in, uh, in Phoenix, the uh, Founders event, and that's where they, uh, they, they really celebrate the, the women that, that founded uh, what is now the, uh, the LPGA. We, we have the same thing in, in British Columbia, and I don't think it got, it got emphasized enough at, uh, um, at our AGM, but I would like to uh, specifically point to people like Ann Peabody and Helen Steves and Barb Rainey and Ann Warrender, Barb Sylvester, um, who have been long, long, long time volunteers with the BC Ladies Golf Association course raiders. Um, they built that association into one of the best in the, uh, in the country. 
um, then they had the foresight to get together and recognize that for the, the in the best interests of the sport, um, that there should be an amalgamation between the uh, the men and the uh, and the women, and they forced that and ultimately became the uh, uh, the first president of the uh, the association. And I I still think that they need to be recognized for all of the work that they did in building women's golf in, uh, in British Columbia. So to all of you ladies, thank you very much. We still have a few more minutes. Are there any questions that anybody would like to ask? Yes, Ray. Joan, is the, is the city of uh, Vancouver Parks looking at anything like that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Actually, Colin and I were just talking about this, or just before we came into this room, about some other initiatives that would um, really drive that traffic out to the golf courses, to the pitch and putts. Um, we do have three, and they're very well used and successful. Um, and that is, it is a great starting point for a lot of women to get into the sport. Uh, so yes, it is, it is a consideration for us. Colin, can you mention anything about Shots in the Night? Uh, sure, so, so Shots in the Night, if anybody I did a podcast episode on this, so you can listen to that. That's an Indian Wells golf course. So what they did, being very entrepreneurial, about three years ago, they looked at how can we create more value for the golf course. So they really looked at it as a business decision. And they took that Uber or Airbnb approach. What is an underutilized asset? So rather than a car or someone's house, they looked at the golf course and they said, well, at night, for first they looked at it, well, do we want to do a top golf type thing? And they looked at that, well, that will actually cannibalize and compete against the 36 holes we have that are already very, very, very full and active. We're making good money there. But how can we unlock new customers, non-golf customers? in a different way. So what they did is what they came up with is shots in the night. So working through. So this is, by the name, is something that occurs at night. They have a big putting green there and also the driving range. So they have this fun, family-oriented, younger, uh, for younger people, and also for people they found, uh, as an insight, that have left the game. They've either aged out or because of physical um, uh, uh, issues that they can't play traditional 18 holes anymore. So they found that this was this funnel, this gateway uh, to get people to come out and play golf and experience that. So they've done a few top golf things. There's the entertainment and hospitality piece. They've got food trucks come in. They've got their own brand of shots in the night beer now. And the very interesting thing that this was true uh, as managing uh, the golf course, but ultimately it is, uh, it is Indian Wells that were the ones that put this thing together. So the great validator of this, and they opened the public in November, and their uh, revenue estimate was $700,000 in the first year over 12 months. They shattered that within nine weeks. And they're just finding now that people are just, more people are coming and more people are coming. And the great thing about this, and Topgolf has the success point too, and I do think it's only working Topgolf, so I understand the model quite well. The fact that it's time-based, rather than one of the functions of golf, it's very linear, or like a tube of toothpaste. People have to start at one end and come out through the other for the whole time issue. That when it's a time-based uh, engagement, it's one hour, half an hour, two hours, whatever that is, it completely flips the script on that for the opportunities. So with Shots of the Night, they've now validated this. It's been incredibly popular, like I said, and they're also finding the insights, and Steve Rosen is the general manager, and happy to make that introduction if you'd like to learn more from Steve and what they're doing at Indian Wells. But they've also found people have come through. They've never been to a golf course before. As you 
probably know your operators here and owners. One of the most difficult things is getting that person onto your property. It's like getting anybody into a bricks and mortar store. Once they're there, that first level of engagement, you have to exceed their expectations so that they come back more. So they're finding through this funnel now that people are saying, hey, I really like that experience. I'm going to take a lesson. Maybe I'll come and play around. I haven't played in a while. Or even more financially uh, advantageous is we'll come back to my family on a Sunday and come for brunch and end up spending $200. So now they're coming back that they've built that relationship and Shots in the Night was that springboard, that catalyst for that, but it's also an extra revenue gener generator, just like MSOP. I saw some a gentleman I need to talk to with an MSOP jacket on. Very similar with the major series of putting. You can have a competition and drive more people to your golf course that have never been there before. So there's all these other ways. It's not just one magic silver bullet that's going to, uh, to move golf forward, but we have all these other, other elements. So if you'd like to learn more about Shots in the Night, uh, yeah, come talk to me afterwards. I'm happy to show you what All right. There's a couple of other things that I should uh, uh, let people know. First of all, our first major event of the year is coming up in May the North Pacific Junior Girl Matches, which will be held at Quilchina, and I see Kim LeClerc is here uh, today. Um, this is a match play competition between British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Um, we are the defending champion, I think two-time defending champion now. Uh, we're going, sorry, we're going for uh, a four-peat. Um, this is where we get the uh, the top junior girls in the province together and we, we compete in a match play uh, event. We also have later this summer the Canadian Senior Women's Championship will be at Asoyas. Um, so we're really looking forward to, uh, uh, to hosting that event. Um, so it's, uh, it's going to be a, uh, uh, a very good uh, summer for women's golf in, uh, in British Columbia. And that takes us, uh, we've got about 10 minutes now. Oh, sorry, Joan. Did you want to mention Eagles Empty, the Woodwack coming up later? It'll come up in the next session. So if there's no other questions, grab yourself a cup of coffee, and uh, we will be back at 1130 sharp to uh, start the next session. Thank you.